We all know that David Letterman was the greatest talk show who, uh, host who ever lived. But I... Let's face it, there are simply are no words that can encapsulate the sheer magnitude of what Dave has achieved these past 33 years. Because he was so good. I love Letterman. Truly one of the funniest people. A man whose gifts to the world of comedy rival even Twain himself. In the world of comedy, late night television is a very popular topic and outlet. An incredibly common thing a lot of comedians do is seek the opportunity to make an appearance on a late night talk show alongside a host that can help promote what they do as a comedian and highlight what makes them unique. This brings us to David Letterman. David Letterman. David Letterman. David Letterman. David Letterman. Who is David Letterman? David Letterman has certainly blessed the world with some of the greatest moments in late night history, and he's also had some phenomenal comedians make their late night debuts on his show. Not only is David Letterman extremely witty and funny himself, but he has this Johnny Carson-like ability to allow his guests to demonstrate what makes them funny and unique. And then after that, he can playfully banter and add his thoughts to the conversation without stealing the limelight or stepping on their toes. This creates a unique experience for the viewer where they get to appreciate Letterman's contributions to his guest's appearance without taking away from their personal appeal. How does David Letterman nail this host-guest dynamic so perfectly every time? Why does the Letterman YouTube channel have over half a million subscribers and over a quarter of a billion total channel views? Why do so many people love David Letterman? Why does Norm Macdonald consider David Letterman to be the greatest talk show host to ever live? By the end of this video, you will know exactly who David Letterman is, where he came from, some of the amazing work he's done, and what makes him such a terrific and gifted late night television host who is adored by the people to no end. This is the comedian that changed television forever. On April 12, 1947, David Michael Letterman was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. His father was Harry Joseph Letterman, who worked as a florist, and his mother was Dorothy Marie Letterman. But you all probably know her as Dave's mom. During Dave's childhood, though, his mother would also work as a secretary at their local church, which was the Second Presbyterian Church of Indianapolis. David also had two sisters, his older sister Gretchen Letterman and his younger sister Janice Letterman. It turns out, Janice is a good lady. I'd like to meet her when- ah, fuck, I forgot she vanished. The Letterman family grew up on the north side of Indianapolis in a small town called Broad Ripple Village, which is one of the seven cultural districts located in Marion County, Indiana. Growing up, Dave and his family were within 15 miles of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and this would spark Dave's fascination with cars very early on in his life, and led him to becoming a car connoisseur. Hailing from the American Midwest, which has a strong automotive culture, it was incredibly common to see young lads growing up and wanting to either drive race cars or just collect cars later in their life. Dave was certainly a part of this cultural phenomenon, and this led to him collecting model cars and racers at a young age. Dave would often ask his father on weekends when he was off school if he could go to the Motor Speedway to see some of the cars race. His father, Harry, was his favorite person in the world, and many of these trips to the Indy Motor Speedway would solidify a strong father-son bond between the two. Dave admired everything about his father. One of the things he admired most was Harry's ability to be funny and witty in any social setting. He actually did an interview with Esquire where he said he really loved how his father could seemingly be the life of the party anywhere he went. When Dave turned 14, he would attend Broad Ripple High School, and this is where he began to showcase his interest in broadcasting and entertainment. During his high school years in the 1960s, Letterman was a very engaged student. He actively participated in the school's radio and television programs, foreshadowing his future career in media. His early experiences in these programs allowed him to develop and start to refine his comedic flair, setting the stage for the witty and charismatic persona he later became known for. Broad Ripple High School also served as the breeding ground for Dave's early comedic performances. His humor characterized by its dry wit and clever observations began to capture the attention of his peers and teachers. Similar to his father Harry, Dave would find himself making his classmates and instructors laugh in the radio and broadcasting programs, and this enjoyment he got from making people laugh would soon become an addiction for him. His charisma and comedic timing were evident even in those formative years. While in high school, 
Dave would also get his first job working as a stock boy and grocery clerk at the local Atlas supermarket in Broad Ripple Village to try and save money. After several years passed and Dave was getting ready to graduate from high school, he would start to set his eyes on a university he could attend to study film and broadcasting. According to the Ball State Daily News, he originally wanted to attend Indiana University. However, Dave's academic achievements were not outstanding enough for him to get accepted into Indiana University. So as an alternative, he would apply for Ball State University located in Muncie, Indiana. The foundation laid during his high school years set the trajectory for his future endeavors in the broadcasting and entertainment industry. Industry. The next chapter of Dave's life would begin shortly after his high school graduation, and it would certainly play a pivotal role in shaping the young man and eventually artist we would all come to know and love. David studied telecommunications at Ball State, where he continued to explore and develop his passion for broadcasting. He actively participated in the university's radio and television programs, gaining practical experience that would prove invaluable in his later career. His involvement in these activities allowed him to refine his comedic skills and develop the engaging and humorous style that would become synonymous with his on-screen persona. Dave would join the Sigma Chi fraternity, and this would lead to Dave really getting to show off his personality to his classmates. While attending college, Dave would also meet a woman named Michelle Cook in Muncie, Indiana, that he would start dating while in his early years at Ball State University. Then in 1968, Dave and Michelle would get married. Furthermore, his unmatched wit and charisma were evident in his performances, setting him apart from his contemporaries. It was also during this time that Letterman began to consider a career in comedy and entertainment. Fueled by the encouragement and positive feedback he received from his incredibly funny anecdotes and one-liners, David Letterman would begin his broadcasting career as an announcer and newscaster at the college's student-run radio station, WBST, which is a 10-watt campus station that is now part of the Indiana Public Radio. At WBST, Letterman gained practical experience as a radio announcer, honing his skills in communication and entertainment. This hands-on experience at the campus radio station allowed him to develop his unique style, which combined humor, wit, and charismatic on-air presence. Dave would then get fired from WBST, and the only documented reason given was that he was not particularly fond or respectful of classical music, which is an odd reason to be fired from a radio station, but it is what it is. However, after being fired, Dave would move on with his life and then go to establish a new on-campus radio station called the WAGO AM 570, which nowadays is called the WCRD 91.3. Then in 1969, Dave would graduate from the Department of Radio and Television at Ball State University. Unlike Conan O'Brien, who was a high school valedictorian and Harvard graduate with a perfect GPA, David Letterman was a self-proclaimed average student who never really spent a lot of time worrying about his grades. This was the same reason that he unfortunately was not accepted into Indiana University, but it ended up working out for him in the long run because he would go on to have a scholarship named after him. It was titled the Letterman Telecommunications Scholarship, and it would be for what Dave considered to be C students. Funnily enough, if you look up the scholarship online, the criteria states grades are not to be a criterion or condition for eligibility, evaluation, or consideration, but a recipient's grades must be high enough to meet minimum enrollment requirements of Ball State University and the Department of Telecommunications. It's almost like Dave wrote this himself. After graduating from Ball State University with a degree in telecommunications, Letterman embarked on his professional journey in broadcasting. His experiences at Ball State laid the groundwork for the confidence and skills he would bring to his early roles as a radio announcer and later as a television host. In acknowledgement of his alma mater's influence on his life and career, Ball State University awarded David Letterman an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree in 2007. Letterman has maintained a connection with the university, occasionally returning for special events and contributing to the school's telecommunication program. In recognition of his contributions and achievements, David Letterman's alma mater, Broad Ripple High School, renamed its television studio the David Letterman Communication and Media Building in his honor. This acknowledgement reflects the lasting impact he has had on the field of communications and media, showcasing the importance of his formative years at Broad Ripple High School. David Letterman's time at Ball State University played a crucial role in shaping his trajectory in the entertainment industry. The education and experiences he gained during his college years laid the foundation for the successful career that would follow, marking the beginning of his journey as one of the most iconic figures in late-night television history. After graduating from college, Dave would then register for the draft and also pass his physical, so at the time, 
there is a very real possibility that Dave would be drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. Luckily for the world of entertainment, he was not drafted into the military. However, shortly after graduating from college, Dave would be watching TV with his family, and he would see comedian and entertainer Paul Dixon on television performing. And this would inspire Dave to really pursue a career as an entertainer and television personality. Paul Dixon had an extra big influence on Dave because he was the host of The Paul Dixon Show, which was a radio talk show that was often played in Indianapolis while he was growing up. Dave actually went on the record and stated how Paul Dixon inspired him. He said, quote, I was just out of college in 1969, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and then all of a sudden I saw him doing it on TV, and I thought, that's really what I want to do, end quote. Then later on, Dave would continue his career in radio and acquire his first gig hosting a radio talk show on the WNTS AM radio station. He would also work on the Indianapolis T station titled WLWI as a news anchor and weatherman. David Letterman's approach to delivering the weather forecast was incredibly unconventional, reflecting the irreverent and humorous style that would later become a hallmark of his comedic persona. Dave's style was different because he would almost make a mockery of the weather. Something he received a lot of attention for was congratulating a tropical storm when it was upgraded to a hurricane and predicting hailstones the size of canned hams. Throughout his years, David Letterman continued to inject humor into his broadcasts, often delivering the weather with witty remarks and playful banter. His unique and entertaining presentation style gained attention, making him a memorable figure in the local broadcasting scene. Another thing he did was he would also occasionally report the weather and the day's very high and low temperatures for fictional cities. On other occasions, one time he said that the state border between Indiana and Ohio was erased when a satellite map accidentally omitted it, attributing it to dirty political dealings. We're under a flash flood warning, but all of that seems of little importance once you take a look at the cloud cover photograph made earlier of the United States today, and I think you'll see that once again we've fallen to the prey of political dirty dealings. And right now you can see what I'm talking about. The higher-ups have removed the border between Indiana and Ohio, making it one giant state. Personally, I'm against it. <laughs> All this tomfoolery on the Weather Channel really made it abundantly clear that Dave had the same gift that his father, Harry, had for making people laugh. And he was using it on the radio talk show and Weather Channel to stand out and make people's days a little brighter. David Letterman would also star in a local kiddie show. He made wisecracks as host of a late night TV show called Freeze Dried Movies, and he also hosted a talk show that aired early on Saturday mornings called Clover Power, in which he interviewed 4-H members about their projects. With his utter disregard for the reverence of the weather and the other activities he participated in while at the news station, it's no wonder that Norm Macdonald had such a deep respect and love for Dave's style and sense of humor. By the way, if you're enjoying the video so far and finding value in the content you're watching, please be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to show your appreciation, because you have nothing to lose by doing so. Every new subscriber helps the channel grow, and I appreciate you watching the content. Then in 1971, Dave had the opportunity to interview drivers and cover the Indianapolis 500 for the first time. The Indy 500, held annually at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, is a significant part of the city's culture, and Letterman's passion for cars and racing made him a fitting personality to cover the event. This was Dave's first nationally televised appearance, and while there, he was actually introduced with the wrong name. But let's get a report now. Chris Economaki has Mario Andretti. Mario, what happened? But this was corrected for the record at the end of the news segment. Dave would then interview racer Mario Andretti, who had just crashed out of the race and asked him what went wrong and what he would work on for the next race. What about the traffic? The faster cars coming up with the slower ones now. Well, that's a uh, normal uh, pace of the race. I mean, this you see everywhere. That's no particular problem. Thank you very much. Mario Andretti out of the 1971 Indianapolis 500 mile race. Okay, the green flag is out there racing again. I may have said that was Chris Economaki doing the interview. It was actually Dave Letterman. At long last, after many years of hard work in high school and at Ball State University honing his craft on being on the air and in front of a camera with his sharp wit, it would seem that David Letterman found his home. However, despite his success in injecting humor into the weather reports and doing local interviews, Letterman's career took a turn when the station underwent changes that led to his dismissal. The exact circumstances of his departure may vary in different accounts, but it's generally recognized that his departure from WNTS marked a transition in his career. Letterman's time as a weatherman on the show was a stepping stone in his journey to become a prominent figure in the entertainment industry. His ability to infuse humor into even the most routine segments, such as weather forecasts, foreshadowed the comedic brilliance that would later define his tenure as a late-night television host. After leaving the show, Letterman continued to build his career, eventually achieving widespread recognition for his innovative and humorous contributions to the world of broadcasting. 
This was an incredibly dark and directionless period of Dave's life because it would seem like he would be out of work for the foreseeable future. Dave had an amazing personality, but given the common practice of traditional journalism, his irreverent style of humor and wit that he brought to the table was not fully appreciated for his time. It would seem that Dave had found something he really enjoyed doing, but that he needed to find a way to make his style of humor work on TV. Then he remembered one of his heroes, Paul Dixon, and how he was an entertainer long before he had his own show. A few years went by, and Dave was between a rock and a hard place. Unfortunately for Dave, his world would drastically change and become a little dimmer as well, when on February 13th, 1973, his father, Harry Letterman, would tragically lose his life after waging a courageous battle against an attack from his own heart. This would prove to be an incredibly traumatic experience for Dave, and his life slowed down for a little bit so he could spend time with family and reprioritize what was important to him. However, Dave knew that his father wouldn't want him to spend too much time mourning, and that he'd want Dave to continue to chase his dream and passion of being the life of the party just like he was. Then in 1975, David Letterman would make the decision to move to Los Angeles, California, with the hopes of becoming a comedy writer. This decision was made after influence from his first wife, Michelle, and also several of his brothers in the Sigma Chi fraternity. So all they did was pack up Dave's pickup truck and drove west to California. One of the key factors that prompted Letterman's move was his aspiration to make a mark in the highly competitive world of show business centered in Los Angeles. The move allowed him to be closer to the heart of the entertainment industry, where he believed he could find more substantial opportunities for growth and exposure. With his experience being witty and making his sly jokes on television as a weatherman and on the radio as a radio show host, Dave would take his talent and apply it to the world of stand-up comedy when he started performing at the world-famous Comedy Store. When starting comedy, some of Dave's early influences were Johnny Carson, Paul Dixon, Jonathan Winters, Don Rickles, and David Brenner. Dave would improve very quickly as a stand-up comedian given the massive amount of stage time available in Los Angeles in the early 70s. David Letterman's early days in stand-up comedy were marked by his unique style, observational humor, and a distinctive stage presence that would later become his trademark. He was also known for his self-deprecating humor, witty observations, and clever storytelling. His dry wit and sarcastic delivery set him apart from other comedians of this time period. Letterman's material often focused on everyday experiences, the quirks of human behavior, and his own life creating a relatable and engaging comedic style. In 1975, he would make his first appearance on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, a pivotal moment in his career. I get up and I go to the lavatory of the aircraft and there's this enormous sign above the toilet that says, do not place metal or glass objects in the toilet. Now, that always ruins a trip for me. I, uh... <laughs> I like to go back there, wash a load of dishes in it, you know? So. <laughs> His stand-up performances on Carson's show garnered attention and helped propel him into the national spotlight. Letterman's frequent appearances as a guest on The Tonight Show solidified his reputation as a talented comedian and led to guest hosting opportunities when Carson was away. Also the same year, while on stage, Jimmy Walker would watch David Letterman's set one night at the Comedy Store after being referred by George Miller. This would lead to Dave getting a gig from Jimmy Walker as a comedy writer. Dave would be writing jokes for Jimmy Walker's stand-up act, and along with him were other legendary comedians Jimmy hired, such as Jay Leno, Paul Mooney, Richard Jenny, and many more. In addition to that, this would lead to other opportunities for David Letterman, such as becoming a comedy writer for the popular sitcom that starred Jimmy Walker titled Good Times. Letterman worked as a writer for the show, contributing to the scripts and helping develop comedic content for Walker's character, J.J. Evans. Good Times was a spin-off of the earlier series, Maud, and focused on the lives of the Evans family, an African-American family living in a public housing project in Chicago. Jimmy Walker played the role of J.J. Evans, a character known for his catchphrase, Dynamite! David Letterman's time as a writer on Good Times allowed him to further establish himself in the television industry. While Good Times primarily focused on social and family issues, it also incorporated humor and Letterman's comedic talents were put to use in crafting jokes and dialogue for the characters. It's worth noting that Letterman's work on Good Times was part of his broader involvement in the entertainment industry during the 1970s. His experience as a stand-up comedian, appearances on talk shows like The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, and writing for sitcoms contributed to his growing reputation as a versatile and talented comedic figure. The opportunities for David Letterman were only just beginning as well. By the summer of 1977, Letterman was a writer and regular on the six-week summer series The Starland Vocal Band Show. 
broadcast on CBS. This was another amazing experience for Dave very early on in his career, and it certainly would make paying the bills in California much easier in the meantime. Then in 1977, Dave would host a pilot titled The Riddlers, which would unfortunately not be picked up by a network. The Riddlers was a game show that he developed and hosted in 1977. The show was created by Letterman and Bob Einstein, also known as Super Dave Osborne, and it featured a unique and unconventional format. The Riddlers was not a traditional game show in the sense of quizzes or trivia questions. Instead, it was a comedy game show that revolved around a panel of celebrities trying to solve various puzzles and riddles. The show combined elements of humor, wordplay, and improvisation. One of the notable features of The Riddlers was its humorous and lighthearted approach to game show conventions. The celebrities on the panel, along with Letterman, engaged in banter and comedic interactions while attempting to solve the puzzles presented to them. Despite the pilot being produced, it did not progress to become a full-fledged series. The show's concept and format might not have resonated strongly with network executives or audiences at the time. However, the pilot serves as an interesting footnote in David Letterman's career, showcasing his versatility and experimentation with different television formats. Despite not being picked up, Dave would move on with the experience and on to the next project. Unfortunately for Dave, in October 1977, he and his wife, Michelle Cook, would divorce because of irreconcilable differences. This would be a devastating part of Dave's life, but it did not slow him down in his career pursuits. After the divorce in January 1978, Dave would co-star in the Barry Levinson-produced comedy special titled Peeping Times. This was another awesome experience for Dave, given the fact that he'd be writing and performing comedy and gaining more experience being funny on air, which would come in handy when he would eventually transition into late-night television. Also, in 1978, Letterman would get into a relationship with Meryl Marco, who would also end up being one of the head writers for Late Night while Letterman was on the show. They would end up dating and living together for around 10 years. Then later in 1978, Dave was a cast member on Mary Tyler Moore's variety show, Mary. This variety show was a departure from Mary Tyler Moore's sitcom roots and featured musical performances, comedy sketches, and guest appearances. Letterman, known for his wit and comedic talents, was one of the many guests on the show. During his appearance on Mary, Letterman likely participated in comedic sketches and provided entertainment through his humorous observations. The show aimed to showcase a diverse range of talents and entertain its audience with a mix of music, comedy, and other performances. While specific details about David Letterman's segment on Mary may not be readily available, his involvement in variety shows and late-night television during this period was indicative of his growing presence in the entertainment industry. This was a time when Letterman was gaining recognition for his comedic abilities. Dave would then make a bunch of different guest appearances on many different different TV shows over the next few years, such as Mork and Mindy where he parodied Werner Erhard, and also a few game shows such as The $20,000 Pyramid, The Gong Show, Hollywood Squares, Password Plus, and Liars Club. As well as the Canadian cooking show Celebrity Cooks in November 1977, talk shows such as 90 Minutes Live in February 24 and April 14, 1978, and The Mike Douglas Show on April 3rd, 1979, and February 7th, 1980. It was at this point Dave really started to expand outside of just comedy into several different acting roles as well. He was actually screen tested in 1980 for the lead role in the film Airplane. Despite Dave's audition going well, he would eventually be beat out by Robert Hayes, who would then play the role in the movie. With all these credits just building up Dave's resume over time, he would also, in the meantime, continue to make guest appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. His segments often featured sharp, observational comedy, humorous anecdotes, and banter with Johnny Carson that resonated with his viewers. This made him stand out a lot, and Johnny really fell in love with the style of humor that Dave encapsulated. In Letterman's formative years, he made an astounding amount of appearances on The Tonight Show, counting 22 total appearances. This was a very pivotal time for Letterman because Johnny Carson would go on to be one of his greatest mentors and certainly his biggest comedic influence on stage as a stand-up comic and behind the desk as a future late-night television host. Then in 1978, Johnny Carson would give David Letterman the opportunity to guest host The Tonight Show, and Dave immediately felt at home. His guest hosting stints were incredibly well received, showcasing his comedic talents to a much broader audience. After a successful performance as the guest host, Dave would soon become a regular guest host for the show, and this would allow him to start to deeply develop his late-night hosting chops and make his transition to becoming a late-night host that much easier down the road. One of the most memorable moments in the history of The Tonight Show occurred on May 22, 1992, when Johnny Carson hosted his final episode. David Letterman was the featured guest, and their conversation was heartfelt and reflective. Dave paid tribute to Johnny Carson, expressing his deep gratitude and admiration for him. David later followed this trend with one of the greatest comedians of all time. If you're a fan of this channel, you already know who this comedian is, but we will get to that later on. 
But all in all, David Letterman's time on The Tonight Show played a pivotal role in his career, providing him with the exposure, credibility, and a platform to showcase his comedic talents. It was a crucial stepping stone towards his eventual success as the host of his own late-night talk show, Late Night with David Letterman. On June 23, 1980, Letterman was given his own morning comedy show on NBC, titled The David Letterman Show. It was originally 90 minutes long, but was shortened to 60 minutes in August 1980. The show was a critical success, winning two Emmy Awards, but was destroyed in the ratings, and this led to the show's cancellation. The last show aired October 24, 1980. In sum, the early part of Dave's career, he had already accomplished a lot as a comedian, writer, and also as a show host. After gathering experience on TV as a weatherman and on the radio show, he decided to move to Los Angeles where he pursued his dream of being a comedy writer. Given the profound impact Dave's father had on him in his early years, this admiration for his father would manifest into Dave wanting to be the life of the party and seen as funny anywhere he went. He would lean into his quirks and dry sense of humor, and with that came Dave starting to find his voice as an entertainer, and in a very short time of moving to California, he would start to receive opportunities as a comedian and writer. Although Dave's experience with his own show, The David Letterman Show, was short-lived, it would lead a direct line into the next opportunity for Dave that would drastically impact his comedy career. With all of this experience, it would not be long before Dave would receive one of the biggest opportunities of his entire life and would inevitably make his dreams come true. Despite the ratings failure of The David Letterman Show, NBC still had a high level of interest in finding a show for David Letterman given his unique sense of humor and his ability to host a riveting late-night talk show as seen on his guest hosting appearances for The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. In the eyes of NBC, David Letterman was incredibly valuable to have on their network, so in the meantime, they would continue to pay him while they transferred his show to a different time slot. David Letterman was still held in high enough regard by the network brass, especially NBC president Fred Silverman, that upon hearing the 33-year-old comedian was being counted by a first-run syndication company, NBC gave him a $20,000 per week deal to sit out a year and guest host The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson on multiple occasions. That's a boatload of cash just to sit and wait for NBC to give you a show and work as Johnny Carson's alternate. Then on February 1st, 1982, the world would see the debut of Late Night with David Letterman, in which the first guest was Bill Murray. The head writers on the show would be Meryl Marco, Jim Downey, Steve O'Donnell, and Rob Burnett. Late Night originated from NBC Studio 6A at the RCA building at 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. This first show featuring Bill Murray would go on to become a legendary moment in late night history because it was not only Letterman's late night residency hosting debut for NBC, but the audience he had cultivated over the last few years as a guest on The Tonight Show finally had what they had been yearning for all along, a regular show hosted by David Letterman. At this time, Johnny Carson was seen as the king of late night television, and it would now appear that David Letterman was the prince of late night TV, who was fresh on the scene and newer to the game, but loved just as much as Johnny Carson, of course. Bill Murray would become a regular guest on Late Night with David Letterman because of the undeniable chemistry on screen between him and Dave. And this was also a time when Bill Murray helped to bring a wider audience to NBC's late night show with Dave. Bill Murray was such a favorite of his that he'd end up guesting on his later CBS show celebration of his 30th anniversary in late night television, which aired January 31st, 2012, and on the final CBS show, which aired May 20th, 2015. The show typically ran Monday through Thursday nights at 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time, immediately following The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. This is what I meant earlier when I said that fans of Carson were spoiled because they loved when Dave was a guest and guest host, and now they would get the best of both worlds back-to-back -back Monday through Thursday. Eventually, due to high demand, NBC would add an extension to the show's schedule by adding a broadcast on Friday night at the same time, which gave Dave even more airtime and opportunity to continue to hone his craft as a late-night TV host. In addition to playing five nights a week, the show had a distinctive and unconventional set featuring a skyline backdrop of New York City and a desk adorned with an electronic billboard displaying humorous messages. The set design became iconic and synonymous with Letterman's Late Night brand. Compared to The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, Late Night with David Letterman was considered to be much edgier and way more unpredictable. This would attract a large dedicated following of young college-aged men, which at the time was an incredibly coveted and sought-after demographic of viewership. One of the most iconic segments on Late Night was the Top 10 list. Each episode featured a humorous list of 10 items on a particular theme, often presented with wit and satire. The Top 10 list became became a recurring and beloved feature throughout Letterman's late night career. Uh, top 10 signs now that the government is running out of money. Number 10. 
State dinners are at IHOP. Well, that's not a bad idea. A country renamed United States of Ditech.com, number eight. Another unique part of the show was when Letterman introduced segments where audience members showcased unusual and entertaining talents performed by pets or themselves. These segments became fan favorites and added a humorous and unpredictable element to the show. Also, Letterman was known for his engaging interviews with celebrities. His interactions were characterized by humor, spontaneity, and occasional irreverence. The show featured a wide range of guests from the entertainment industry, including actors, musicians, and comedians. Letterman would often find himself in heated arguments or discussions with some of his well-known guests, such as Charles Grodin, Madonna, and Shirley MacLaine. The show also featured comedy segments and running characters in a style that was clearly derivative of the 1950s and 60s programs of Steve Allen. Late Night was known for its inventive comedy sketches and remote segments. Letterman often took the show outside the studio, engaging in humorous interactions with people in the streets of New York City. Miss, for a dollar, any thoughts on what David Letterman's next move should be? Uh... <laughs> Retire, lots of happiness. Oh, oh that's, that's very nice. Sweet. That's very sweet. <laughs> should David Letterman do a podcast now? Sure. Okay. Yeah. What, what should it be about? Whatever he wants, New York City. Yeah, I, I do a podcast about guys wearing shorts when it's too cold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Goodbye, sir. David Letterman's comedic style and departure from the traditional talk show format helped redefine late-night television, because he brought a much more edgy and irreverent tone to the genre, appealing to a much younger and more diverse audience. Letterman had a penchant for giving ironically named titles to his segments, for instance, Viewer Mail, which often featured humorous responses to letters from viewers, and Small Town News, showcased bizarre and amusing news stories from local newspapers. To coincide with the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, Letterman hosted the Late Night Olympics, a comedic take on the traditional sporting event, the segments featured humorous competitions such as Velcro suit jumping and desk diving. Before continuing, it was around 1986 when Dave would meet Regina Lasko, and they would start dating and eventually get married later in 2009. Anyway, the show celebrated its fifth anniversary with a memorable special episode in 1987. It featured appearances by Bill Murray, Paul Newman, and other celebrities, along with memorable moments from the show's first five years. Occasionally, Letterman invited guest hosts to host the show while he took breaks. Notable guest hosts included Tom Snyder and Sandra Bernhard. These guest host stints added variety and showcased different comedic styles. Late Night featured a wide range of musical guests spanning various genres. Iconic performances and interviews with musicians added a dynamic element to the show's entertainment value. Over the years, Late Night with David Letterman received critical acclaim and won several Emmy Awards. Letterman himself received numerous accolades for his contributions to the television industry. The show was absolutely crushing the ratings even after Johnny Carson's Tonight Show. Letterman was still able to sustain his audience for many years because the show consistently delivered top-notch interviews, comedy sketches, and also stand-up comedy performances. Dave also had an incredible eye for scouting out young talent he thought would do well on his show given his audience and experience of performing comedy himself for so many years. Speaking of which, one of the best stand-up comedy performances we ever got to see on Late Night with David Letterman was, you guessed it, Frank Stallone. No, but seriously, on May 9th, 1990, we got to see the late-night television debut of one of, if not the most unique and brilliant comedians of all time, Norm MacDonald. Norm was one of Dave's favorite comedians to have on a show, given their shared sense of humor and dry, sarcastic wit and delivery. I don't want to gush too much over Norm just yet, but this late-night debut of his was near the end of David Letterman's reign on Late Night. For a decade, David Letterman ran one of the most popular late-night tenures in history and set an incredible precedent moving forward of how the show should be run and proving that an unconventional style could prove to be extremely successful if you worked hard enough and have a talented enough team of writers and producers to make it possible. This paved the way for Conan O'Brien just a few years later. Then in 1992, ten years after David Letterman started his tenure at Late Night, Johnny Carson would announce his retirement from The Tonight Show. Upon his retirement announcement, Johnny Carson publicly stated that he believed that David David Letterman would be the perfect candidate to take over at The Tonight Show, given the immense amount of success he had seen in his decade at the Late Night program. Despite his flaming endorsement from Johnny Carson, NBC announced that instead of Letterman, the replacement host would be Jay Leno on The Tonight Show. Obviously, this went against the wishes of Johnny Carson, and this decision really bummed out Dave because he had really hoped to take over for Johnny given his immense amount of admiration and respect for him as a host. Johnny also believed that Letterman deserved it given the fact that he was his rightful successor, and as a result, 
David Letterman would announce his move on January 14, 1993, to a competing network, CBS. He would be hosting a new show, and Lorne Michaels announced that his replacement would be Conan O'Brien, and that he would start as the show's new host on September 13, 1993. The show won so many different awards, it's actually hard to locate them all. In 2013, the series was ranked number 41 on TV Guide's 60 Best Series of All Time. Additionally, during its run, the show was nominated for the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Variety Series 11 times. It was also nominated for the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Writing for a Variety Series 14 times, winning four and won one Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Directing for a Variety Series out of seven nominations. All in all, David Letterman's tenure on Late Night at NBC was a massive success for him given his dreams and aspirations he always had as a young man. He wanted to be the life of the party and make everyone laugh just like his father Harry did, and he also wanted to be in television broadcasting where he would let his unique personality and sense of humor shine for everyone to appreciate. After 10 full seasons, numerous Emmy Awards, and countless hours of top-tier content recorded, it would seem that David Letterman had made his mark at NBC and that it was time for him to begin the next chapter of his life. He works at Mr. Ketchup Torres down on Sullivan Street, across from the medical center. With Conan arriving at NBC's Late Night, David Letterman had moved to working with CBS and establishing his own late night talk show now titled Late Show with David Letterman, which had its debut episode on August 30th, 1993. The show was produced by CBS and also Letterman's production company known as Worldwide Pants. The head writer that Letterman hired was a guy named Matt Roberts. He's an odd looking duck. In most US markets, the show aired from 11.35 p.m. to 12.35 a.m. Eastern and Pacific time. Given his transition from late night at NBC, this was not a massive adjustment adjustment in time scheduling for Letterman, and was basically the same schedule the show had been on for the last 10 years. The show, even though it ran the same format, would prove to be much bigger and more successful than any of Dave's previous projects thus far. A lot of the sketches and segments that Dave had started on Late Night were unfortunately unable to be crossed over because they were technically the intellectual property of NBC still. So there were some new segments, but also a few of the old ones that they managed to salvage and bring over to CBS through heavy negotiation between networks. This is how the negotiation works. Because of the significant issue regarding Letterman's move to CBS and the ownership of the long-running comedy bits, as well as the name of the CBS show itself, NBC claimed that much of what he did on Late Night was intellectual property of the network, and Letterman and his attorneys countered that some segments, like Stupid Pet Tricks, for example, predated Late Night and had always aired on The David Letterman Show, which was owned by Letterman's production company rather than NBC. And others, such as the top 10 list and viewer mail, were common property and not owned by either Letterman or NBC. Ultimately, a compromise was reached in key areas. The viewer mail segment would be called the CBS Mailbag. The actor portraying Larry Bud Melman on The Late Night would use his real name, Calvin DeForest, on The CBS Show, and Paul Schaefer's World's Most Dangerous Band would become The CBS Orchestra. In addition to the show's sketches and segments, the set was incredibly legendary and memorable for Dave and his audience. The show was taped at the Ed Sullivan Theater in New York City, which became a symbolic and iconic location for Letterman's late night career. The theater had a significant history, having hosted the Ed Sullivan show in the past, when the show debuted, the first episode was quite the spectacle. I'll recount it for you. On August 30th, 1993, David Letterman came out for his first episode to roaring applause and cheering from the same fan base who had stuck with him through his switch from NBC to CBS. After Letterman was introduced on the first episode, NBC nightly news anchor Tom Brokaw accompanied him on stage and wished him luck with the show. Brokaw then proceeded to retrieve a pair of cue cards while stating that these last two jokes are the intellectual property of NBC. After he carried them off stage, Letterman responded, who would have thought you would ever hear the words intellectual property and NBC? in the same sentence. In his opening monologue, Letterman said, legally I can continue to call myself Dave, but joked that he woke up that morning and next to him in bed was the head of a peacock while the orchestra played the theme from The Godfather. Given all the drama David faced with the intellectual property dispute, this was the perfect way for him to handle the situation in a dry and sarcastic manner in typical David Letterman fashion. The show would dominate The Tonight Show with Jay Leno for the first two years, and this was no mystery. It's because Letterman was a breath of fresh air in the late night television landscape. Some of the reasons people loved his show were the same reason they loved him on Late Night. For example, Dave continued to host a wide array of celebrity guests, including actors, musicians, politicians, and comedians. His interviews were known for their wit, humor, and candid nature, and notable guests included iconic figures such as Bill Murray, Julia Roberts, and Tom Hanks. In addition to that, the show featured diverse musical performances ranging from established artists to emerging acts. The musical guests often performed on the show's rooftop over
overlooking Broadway. There are also some incredibly memorable moments from the show, such as the first show after that tragedy, you know, the one where all the stories came crashing down, when Letterman delivered a poignant monologue about the situation and his candid reaction to it. All of these reasons and more led to David Letterman leading the late night TV ratings in the first two years of the show's existence. However, the competition would not cease because Leno pulled ahead on July 10th, 1995, starting with a Hugh Grant interview after Grant's arrest for picking up a Los Angeles prostitute. This was one of those interviews that really just broke television and caused the Tonight Show's numbers to skyrocket like they did when Johnny Carson was still on the air. Jay Leno also benefited from the lead-in provided by NBC's popular must-see TV primetime programs of the mid to late 1990s. This wasn't to say that David Letterman and CBS were suffering in their ratings, they just couldn't keep up with NBC for the time being in the war on the ratings. At times, Late Show even came in third place when it came to ratings, once prompting Letterman to arrange for a Manhattan billboard proudly declaring himself in a show to be number three in Late Night, aping an older, nearby billboard which promoted Leno in The Tonight Show as number one. David attempted to respond by making his show more political, replicating the approach taken by The Daily Show under Jon Stewart. Despite the ratings battle not always going Dave's way, the show still featured regular contributors who became fan favorites, such as Rupert G, the owner of Hello Deli near the Ed Sullivan Theater, and the stage manager, Biff Henderson, who often participated in humorous on-location segments. As mentioned earlier, similar to the viewer mail segment on Late Night, The Late Show had the CBS mailbag, where Letterman read and responded to viewer letters and emails in a humorous and sometimes irreverent manner. The show was a massive success any way you look at it, and the awards would certainly reflect this statement. In 2002, Late Show with David Letterman was ranked number 7 on TV Guide 50 greatest TV shows of all time. As host of both Late Night and Late Show for more than 30 years, Letterman surpassed Johnny Carson as the longest running late night talk show host in 2013. That same year, Late Night and Late Show were ranked at number 41 on TV Guide's 60 best series of all time. The show was nominated for the Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Variety Series 16 times, winning six of those times. It was also nominated for the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Directing for a Variety Series 15 times, and was nominated for the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Writing for a Variety Series 16 times during its run. Then in 2014, Dave made the announcement he would be retiring from late night television, and this news would be incredibly bittersweet for his fans of The Late Show. They were happy to hear Dave was retiring, but incredibly sad he would be stepping down as the host. Then on May 20th, 2015, the final episode of Late Show with Letterman would air, and it would be one of the greatest moments in late night television history without a doubt. I don't want to go too deep into it now because I want to save it for the favorite moments and guest sections, but if you don't know why it was special, here's why. The final stand-up comedy set is performed by Norm MacDonald and is one of the most talked about stand-up comedy sets amongst comedians of all time. Anyway, the ending of the show marked the end of an era in late night television. After 33 long years, Letterman had done everything he wanted to do. He moved to LA with the hopes of becoming a comedy writer, and then by his retirement, he had used his God-given wit and funniness to become one of the most prominent late night hosts of all time. Everything Dave admired about his father, Harry, he himself had become, and then some. Harry would be very proud to see how far his son had come, and that he had made his dreams come true and really impacted the world of comedy and late night television. This was the legendary run of The Late Show with David Letterman. As much as I love David Letterman, it's impossible to make a video about him without covering the scandal he was a part of. During his late night television reign on Late Show at CBS, in October 2009, David Letterman revealed on air during The Late Show that he had been the target of an extortion attempt related to his extramarital affairs. Letterman stated that someone had threatened to expose his sexual relationships with female employees unless he paid a large sum of money. This was an incredibly dark point in Dave's life, and for a brief period he was paralyzed in fear and unsure of how he should proceed with the show given his blackmail attempt. Rather than succumb to the extortion attempt, Letterman decided to go public with the information. During the October 1st, 2009 episode of The Late Show, he admitted publicly to having sexual relationships with members of his staff. Letterman expressed regret for his actions and apologized to his wife, Regina, and the staff members involved. The revelation had personal repercussions for Dave. He publicly apologized to his wife and acknowledged the pain he had caused in his family. Despite the challenges, Dave and his wife chose to work through the difficulties and they remained married. The alleged extortionist, Robert Halderman, a former CBS 
producer, was later arrested and charged with attempted grand larceny. In March 2010, he pleaded guilty to attempted second-degree grand larceny and was sentenced to six months in jail, five years of probation, and 1,000 hours of community service. I'm just going to come out and say it. This Robert Halderman guy was a real jerk. A central figure in the case and one of the women with whom Letterman had had a sexual relationship with was his longtime personal assistant, Stephanie Burkett, who often appeared on the show. She had also worked for 48 hours. Until a month before the revelations, she had shared a residence with Robert Halderman, who allegedly had copied her personal diary and used it along with private emails in the blackmail package. Then on October 3rd, 2009, TMZ reported that a former CBS employee, Holly Hester, had had a year-long secret affair with Dave in the early 1990s while she was his intern and a student at New York University. The biggest conversation that Letterman's scandal brought to the table was whether Dave's fraternization amongst employees of the show created an unfair working environment. A lot of the time, people worry that given these scenarios, if someone was actively seeking promotion and they happen to be sexually involved with the boss, that it could lead to favoritism. This is usually true in most instances, but in Dave's particular situation, this is probably as bad as it could possibly be perceived. Cheating on your wife to lie down with ladies who work under you at the workplace is never good, but Dave is a human being who made a big mistake. This David Letterman guy was a real j- Alright, I'm just kidding. While I obviously do not approve of the behavior Dave participated in, all of the women involved were consenting adults, and I can look past it. I do, however, admire the fact that Dave came right out and admitted it, instead of trying to sweep it under the rug. While the scandal had personal consequences for Dave, including strained relationships, it did not have a lasting negative impact on his television career. He continued to host The Late Show with David Letterman for several more years until his retirement in 2015. Over the years, Letterman has been open about discussing the scandal and its aftermath in various interviews. It's important to note that his scandal is a significant but isolated incident in his career, and he has continued to be regarded as one of the most influential figures in the history of late night television. People's opinions on the matter may differ, but Letterman's handling of the situation and subsequent openness about it have been factors in how the public perceived the event. I still think Letterman's one of the greatest late night hosts of all time, despite this unfortunate event. All in all, this was the infamous scandal of David Letterman. To balance out the negativity from the scandal, I'll now be sharing some of my favorite moments with David Letterman and some of my favorite guests. You already know who my favorite is, so I'm going to go ahead and start with some other people. To begin with, one of my favorite guests to appear on The Letterman Show was comedian David Tell, who made his network television debut on November 24th, 1993. David Tell would absolutely destroy as he commonly does, and he would then sit down with Dave and proceed to exchange wits, and it was a very special moment on Letterman's show. One time I flew to Australia. It takes like two days to get there. And when you get there, it's earlier than when you left. When I landed, I called my house. I picked up the phone. <laughs> you know when you're young, you think your dad's Superman, and then you grow up and you realize he's just a regular guy who wears a cape and... <laughs> it's like, Dave, you can't judge a man till you walk in his shoes. When do you walk in another man's shoes? <laughs> Bowling, it's the only time, right? <laughs> Given Letterman's sharp wit and dry, sarcastic humor, he and Dave Attell would go back and forth, and you could just tell Letterman was loving it. Dave Attell is one of the greatest comedians to ever live, so Dave certainly knew how to extract the maximum amount of funniness out of him while hosting him on the show. My second favorite guest on Letterman's show was comedian and actor Adam Sandler. Sandler would also make his television debut on Letterman's show on April 4th, 1991. Adam Sandler would absolutely bring the heat, and of course would go on to be one of the biggest comedy stars of all time in stand-up, television, and movies. My girlfriend, I got a very smart girlfriend. I'm not that uh, smart, so it's kind of off balance having a smart girlfriend. Our conversations are weird. She's like, your slightest touch propels me into a universe of passion where you rule benevolently over all my emotions. And I'm like, um, uh, you got big jugs. <laughs> Adam Sandler would also experiment with many different characters on Letterman's show, and Dave always really enjoyed these segments. Here's a clip of Sandler trying out a new character on the show. Adam, let me ask you a question. Do you have, like, radon in your apartment? No, Dave. Do you? <laughs> All I want to do is love you! And you keep pushing me away! What do you have in the briefcase? Socks. <laughs> 
I love this moment a lot. It's really cool to see the chemistry that Dave has with Sandler, even when he's in character. I also love the story Sandler tells of his dinner with Bob Barker. It's really funny to think about when you understand that Adam Sandler would later have a cameo of Bob Barker in Happy Gilmore, where he beats the living shit out of Happy Gilmore. Check this clip out. You went I, out to dinner with Bob? Yeah, that was cool. He, he, I ate, sat next to him, and he's a big an, animal uh, oh, rights right, right activist. Sure. And, I for, and I forgot, and I started feeling guilty, you know, because I remember once I had my chicken, and he'd look at me, you know, he'd look at me like, why? Why do you, yeah. why do you hurt the chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, he's like, that chicken has a family. And I was like, you can tell their family that they raised that tasty little chicken. Yeah. The story is really funny, and David Letterman, of course, masterfully extracts the details everyone wants to know with great questions. Finally, my favorite David Letterman guest of all time is Norm MacDonald. He made his late night television debut on Dave's show May 9th, 1990. He did really, really well, and Dave would like Norm so much that he would start to have Norm on as a regular guest. Given the fact that Norm and Dave both had a similar sense of humor with the dry, sarcastic delivery and wit, these two would absolutely become perfect for each other. Not like that, guys. They both own a doghouse, after all. But in the sense that they were the perfect post-guest relationship on a late-night television show. One of my favorite moments of Norm on Letterman's talk show is when he tells Dave a story about baseball player Bob Euchre. I'll show you the clip so you can see for yourself. Bob is a very, very funny man, and, uh, and uh, I, I go, often go in the booth with him, you know. Oh, sure. So uh, one time we were there, <laughs> and uh, John Fogarty was in the audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was talking to me, and he says, hey, man, you know that guy? And I go, yeah. He goes, that's uh, John Fogarty, rock and roll singer. <laughs> so I go, yeah. I go, yeah, yeah, I know who it is. He goes, yeah, man. He goes, uh, but I played in a golf tournament with him. He goes, you probably think of him as some that likes to bite the heads off of chickens, but... Uh, <laughs> This guy can, uh... <laughs> this guy can get it out of the sand trap like nobody's <laughs> business. So, uh... <laughs> yes, Bob, I know who he is. He did Creedence Clearwater sure. Revival. Yeah. He goes, yeah, he did all that. <laughs> I've literally never seen someone make David Letterman laugh like this. I'm sure some of you can find other clips that are comparable, but this really just speaks volume as to how much Dave loves Norm as a guest and a comedian. He's laughing like a giggly teenager at his friend's sleepover and really just savoring the moment. This isn't a Jimmy Fallon exaggerated laugh either. This is just a super genuine hearty laugh Dave is having at Norm MacDonald. You can also see how much Norm is loving it because Letterman was always one of Norm's heroes, and to be cracking him up like this has to be a dream come true for him. It's just an absolutely splendid story from Norm on Dave's show. Another one of my favorite moments is when Norm goes on Letterman's show and talks about getting fired from Saturday Night Live. Norm had just been fired from his dream job as the Weekend Update anchor on Saturday Night Live, and he came on to talk about it to Dave. Dave trashes Don Olmeyer, as Norm said, he's the one that fired him, but Norm refuses to take a low blow and stays kind, and Dave even laughs at how polite Norm is about the whole thing. Check it out. No, you didn't get fired. Yeah, they fired No, me. they didn't fire you. No, I'm serious. I, I, I'm I talked to a guy that said I'm fired. <laughs> fired from your television job? They, they said that this guy, Don Olmeyer, who turns out to be the president. Yeah, now I know Don Olmeyer, and yeah. just between you and me, he's an idiot. Oh. <laughs> So he goes, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I'm firing you there from the show. And then I, I said, uh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> you know? And then I said, why is that now? And he goes, uh, oh, you're not, you know, you're not funny. Yeah. And then I said, uh, I said, holy Lord, that's even worse news, you know? <laughs> he's a good man. Well, he just fired you. What do you mean he's a good What is wrong with you? You quizzling? Stop that. <laughs> I don't know what quizzling means, but... Uh. <laughs> Norm hilariously delivers why he was fired, and Dave just continues to ask the questions that all of us are wondering. This causes us to get the best possible interview from Norm on his exit from Saturday Night Live. Finally, my favorite moment in late night television history is Norm MacDonald's stand-up performance on David Letterman's final episode of Late Show that aired on September 15, 2015. To begin with, Norm takes to the stage and brings some of the best stand-up comedy the world has ever heard. His delivery, stage presence, and jokes are all on point. There is one one country that worries me, though, not Iraq, not Iran, not North Korea. The only country that really worries me is uh, the country of Germany. I don't know if you guys are history buffs or not, but... Uh... <laughs> 
in the early uh, part of the previous century, Germany decided to go to war. And uh, who did they go to war with? The world. <laughs> So you figure that would take about five seconds for the world to win, but uh, no, it was actually close. In addition to this, after telling some of the finest jokes ever written by a comedian, Norm goes on to tell his favorite joke he ever heard Dave tell to the audience. Then after the fact, Norm announces to Dave how thankful he is and that he loves him. If something is true, it is not sentimental. And I say in truth, I love you. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Very funny, Norm. And thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Norm MacDonald, ladies and gentlemen. That was very sweet, Norm. An incredibly sentimental moment from Norm that at the time shocked the world. Norm was not known for being outwardly sentimental often, so this was a huge surprise to his audience and also Dave. We now know that Norm had been waging a courageous battle against cancer for around four years at this point, and this certainly contributed to his tears being shed. I can't really put into words how special this was for Norm and Dave. The same way that Dave made his late night debut on Johnny Carson's show, and then did the final performance when he retired, Norm had just done the same thing for Letterman. After many decades and decades of hard work honing his funniness, Norm would eventually become one of Dave's heroes, and then he had the privilege of doing the final set on his show. It's enough to bring a grown man to tears, and as a 23-year-old deeply closeted gay man, this last Letterman performance brings me to tears just about any time I see it now. Not to mention, this late night comedy set would go on to be one of the most talked about stand-up sets of all time, and this is for good reason. Being the Norm fanboy I am, this Letterman set will certainly get its own video very soon. But all in all, these were some of my favorite moments and guests on David Letterman's late night talk shows. Letterman brought a whole new level of irreverence and edgy humor to late night television. His comedic style was characterized by sarcasm, self-deprecation, and a willingness to push boundaries, challenging the more traditional and formal approach of his predecessors. Johnny Carson took Dave under his wing when he moved to LA, and this really helped Dave find his voice and understand the style he wanted moving forward. With that expertise and mentorship, Dave built an audience of fans who absolutely adored this style of humor, and it really paid dividends for him in the long run. It led to Dave obtaining an incredibly long and distinguished list of awards. For example, Dave was a recipient of the 2012 Kennedy Center Honors, where he was called one of the most influential personalities in the history of television, entertaining an entire generation of late-night viewers with his unconventional wit and charm. Then on May 16, 2017, Letterman was named the next recipient of the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor, the award granted annually by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He received the prize in a ceremony on October 22, 2017, and to the surprise of no one, when Dave won this award, Norm MacDonald would make a statement to honor Dave winning the award. Check this out. The night when we find out who is awarded the Mark Twain Prize. <laughs> Will it be David Letterman, whom this prestigious award was seemingly created to honor? Or will it be Dikembe Mutombo? <laughs> I mean, Mr. Letterman reinvented the late night talk show. Mr. Letterman deconstructed television itself. Mr. Mutombo blocked basketball shots. I mean, I keep waiting for somebody to come out here and tell me this is all some sort of joke. Norm always finds a way to make Dave laugh, even when honoring him for winning an award. Also, Letterman's influence can be seen in the comedic styles of many late-night hosts who followed him. His approach to interviews, the use of his humor in addressing current events, and the incorporation of unconventional segments have become staples of the late-night landscape. Beyond the realm of late-night television, Letterman's impact extended to broader cultural conversations. His irreverent approach and willingness to challenge conventions made him a cultural icon, influencing discussions about humor, media, and entertainment. Since his retirement in 2015, he now hosts the Netflix series My Next Guest Needs No Introduction with David Letterman. All in all, Dave did every single thing he said he was going to do. He wanted a career in radio, he got it. A career in television, he got it. A career in comedy, he got that, and so much more. It started with the admiration for his father being able to be the life of the party and light up the room with laughter and wit, 
but Dave took this burning admiration and became one of the most influential entertainers and late night hosts to ever live. I'm sure in the coming years we will see more amazing things with David Letterman, and I for one am extremely excited to see what magic and mystique he brings to the world of comedy next. This has been the comedian that changed television forever. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the David Letterman video all the way to the end. If you want to support the channel, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications down below because that's a free way to support me and help this community grow one subscriber at a time. And also, make sure to share this video with somebody you think would like it. And if you hated the video, make sure to share it with somebody you don't like. If you want to take your support to the next level, you can check out my Patreon page down below where you can support me for as little as $5 a month. And you get some exclusive benefits such as seeing videos early, seeing exclusive content such as my set from the Tampa Improv. And you also get to play a direct hand in the direction my channel takes. And you also get shoutouts every single video. Shoutout to Crossblocker, Jason Murray, Thomas Gill, and Ethan for being patrons on the channel. But once again, thank you guys so much for watching. Without further ado, I hope you guys take care of yourselves, your friends, your families, your loved ones, anybody important to you. I love you, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.